Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where we talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the season four premiere of The Boys, a great season premiere. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. Well, first and foremost, first and foremost, The Boys are on their mission against Victoria. Who knows what the long plan, what the grand scheme is going to be because later on they end up like switching out what appears to be her eye drops i'm well i think it was eye drops it's like a little bottle so i'm assuming they were hoping that if they could jack up her eyes it wouldn't be able to she wouldn't be able to head pop which we know wouldn't work i mean to be fair we as the audience know that head popping isn't her main power it's just how she utilizes her power because she's a bloodbender like marie so I don't think anyone else understands. Like, I think everyone just thinks she's a head popper, which benefits her just being like that because that way no one, like, the only person that really knows how her powers work is Marie because no one else knows that. So, I mean, it makes you wonder, did Stan understand her power or was, was he even still under the impression she's just a head popper? Whatever the case may be, I think they were probably thinking as long as we damage her eyes, she needs to look at her target to blow them up. So as long as we damage her eyes, maybe they're going to drug her. With, like, who knows what the plan was going to be? Obviously, it went to crap. I even love that line from uh, from uh, Victoria herself being like, somehow you guys managed to get worse and worse at your jobs. Because it's like, yeah, they fumbled this. I mean, at least regardless of the complications, even last season's premiere was still a victory. You know, guy, you know, had it, you know, termite went into his significant other's penis and blew his body up. But still, mission for the most part was kind of a success. So, obviously the team is still unclear that, or unaware that Butcher is sick. And he's still keeping it from everybody. And I love that whole situation where he was kind of left guarding the door. He's the one that kind of gets stuck on that duty that would kind of, if anyone was going to fall on that line, it would probably most likely be like, Huey, but now it's Butcher's relegated to that. And I love, you could see that like happiness in Kimiko's face being like, yeah, it's just like, she was just smirking and uh, grinning in his face about that. It's like, to be fair, it's like, not even just last season, but Butcher's always treated her like crap. He's, al he's always treated her like, everyone else on the boys squad has always been good to her, except for Butcher, and especially last season, the whole like, oh, you're a gun. And it's like, oh, look, look at me taking part in a mission. What about you, Butcher? You're on the outskirts. Ha 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 ha. So it's, it's a little bit of that. Obviously, Butcher screwed the pooch on this whole situation. To be fair, I think it speaks volumes. He went after Ryan instead of going after Homelander, which I think shows personal growth because he's always had a blind spot when it comes to Homelander because he has tunnel vision. Once he sees Homelander, he only sees red. To be fair, it shows like, right, he, he, he recognizes like, well, it's the whole thing of, well, I ended up, I'll create a monster. If I don't pull Ryan back before it's too late, he's going to end up just like his father, which is like also like in his head is like, right, Homelander isn't much of a father. And just with everything Billy said to Ryan last season, he turned to the only father figure because, you know, Homelander happened to say all the right stuff, all the stuff Billy should have said, he ended up saying. So it all, you know. Obviously, Ryan still has his reservations. I thought it was interesting that despite this season three finale, Ryan still has his reservations because he still doesn't do well around crowds of people. And his, his dad's like, no, 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 don't worry about it. Imagine they're all like cockroaches. You wouldn't be bothered by cockroaches, a whole bunch of cockroaches. He was like, yeah, I would. It's like, well, pretend like they're baby chicks or whatever. They're human. We're not. We're better than them. You don't have anything to worry about. But yeah, um, him trying to approach Ryan is what screwed the pooch. But he's still trying to get Ryan to come back to him. He's like, you don't even have to stay with me. You can stay with Grace. Just like stay away from your father. He's not a good dude. He's not your father. You know, and that's also where Ryan finds out the truth about Billy because Homelander's taking delight in it. Like, oh my God, I see that mass in your head. How my own you got? Months? You know, and for Ryan, it's almost like a, whoa, wait. Now he knows, like, it changed. Because I don't, Homelander probably in his head thought, hey, like, after everything Billy did, after everything Billy said, that at the end of the day, I've got my son on my side. He hates Billy. But it, this episode was a rude awakening for him where it's like, okay, my son still has feelings for Butcher. Because as Ryan puts it, he he's the man that my mom loved, you know? So that that's always going to hold a special place. Because... Can the same thing be said about Homelander? To the very end, his mom always pushed back against Homelander and hated Homelander. Rightfully so. But 
I mean, not just from Homelander being the piece of shit that he is, but also him doing the shitty thing that he did and assaulting, you know, uh, Becca. So, but I think that's why he was so okay saying that. Because you would think like, because in his mind, it almost feels like he's wiped out all the weakness that was Becca from, because now it's like without Becca around, you're going to be more like me. Because Becca's the one thing that kept, in his mind in season two, it's like, oh, Becca kept you weak, kept you from fulfilling your full potential and becoming me because especially for Homelander like as this season it seems like this season is really going to revolve around existential crises all across the board once again the beautiful parallel between Butcher who is running out of time and Homelander who time is catching up to because regardless of being this powerful Superman he's still aging which is once again interesting parallel considering like Superman I mean, once again, the TV shows have made this comparison. I don't, I'd assume it works the same way in the comics. He ages slower as a Kryptonian, so he doesn't fully look his own age a lot of times. They make jokes about it, at least like the CW did. So, uh, I, but it seems like we got the whole thing with Homelander having a whole bunch of gray hairs, specifically pubic hairs. Uh, probably has some in his hair too, but. Uh, as Sage puts it later on, your hair uh, person who dyes your hair probably doesn't want to let you know that you have gray hair, so they're probably keeping that from you. So he probably has a lot more than... Because it's like, oh, you have to have your hair dyed, like, what, once a week? Now it's like... Once a month? Now it's like every two and a half weeks? But yeah, like, so interesting, too, because he has this little serial killer treasure box of sorts because he's got... Oh, that picture of Stormfront, never let go of your second love, I guess. He also still has, like, the milk bottle from Madeline, never forget your first love. And then he has Noir's sword, never forget your best friend. And now he's also got, like, a, 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 a container of his gray pubes. So I was like, that's fascinating. Because despite being this, oh, higher being and stuff like that, being this god... He's still so mortal that age can still potentially wipe him out that he's getting older. And that's what, you know, he's, he is going through a midlife crisis. It just makes him, it's it's a reminder that he isn't so above all this. Yeah, he might be stronger than humans, but it goes back to that conversation he had last season with himself in the Herogasm episode about being pure, clean, like Marvel, he literally reiterates that, which I thought was so interesting when he was talking to Sage. He used that exact phrase. Anyway, kind of like circling back to some other stuff I, I, I want to talk about. Huey and Victoria talking, I thought was so interesting because it's not until they start talking that I was like, oh, right. They didn't talk for the rest of season three. Like the last interaction Huey has with Victoria, because at that point in the story, he was still trying to keep it hush hush that he knew about her being the head popper, was episode two is the last time they talked. So I was like, interesting. So funny. Too. Once again, it's all interesting how it ties together too, just because, I mean, it makes sense, but like the same episode that was the last episode they talked is when we got the truth about Red River and Huey kind of thro threatens to throw that in Victoria's face, which I love that she's like, oh, have you, you know, have you seen War Games? I mean, she's like, well, look at you. Of course you've seen War Games. He's like, what are we fucking joking now? But it's like, th there was an interesting conversation and I'm glad we were able to get this like as a scene in the show is him and Victoria, because for him, it's like, you were like family to me. Like, was it all BS? Because it's like, like every, all the good work we did, you know? And for her, it's because she was like, yeah, at one point in time, I was actually going to tell you the truth. And he was like, what stopped you? He's like, oh, like, you know, you were afraid you're going to have to ultimately pop my head. And she's like, no, I was just scared of telling you the truth because she's like, I didn't want to lose my only friend. It's like, yeah, Victoria has people who work for her around her, but the only person she got pretty close to is... Huey, you know, which is ironic. Not trying to get up in their business, but isn't Claudia and uh, Jack still dating? Once again, that's none of my personal business, but I always thought that was interesting. Like, oh yeah, because they actually are dating real life, or at least they were. I don't know if they still are. That's not my business. That's why I just thought was kind of the interesting parallels of stuff like that. But either way, um... I love that he tried to throw acid in her face, which didn't work, which just pissed her off more. She's like, really, motherfucker? Like, I got to go on, like, uh, TV in, like, 10 fucking minutes. Butcher shows up, tries to put a bullet in her head. I'm like, okay, cool. Apparently, the bullet just magically ricocheted. It's like, we once again, we don't know Newman's constitution. We, we don't fully know what she's fully capable of as a bloodbender. 
I mean, we're, we're only getting to, we've only taken steps to fully see what, um, what Marie is capable of. And who knows, like, once again, the power manifests differently, or at least how they utilize it is different. So how Newman's handled it versus how Marie's handled a bloodbender angle. So it's like, I don't know if that's some bloodbending ability she used or what, but like, how does she, how does she do that? Let's get the bullet ricocheted off her head. And so I was like, I don't know how she managed to do that. At the same time, that's all going down. Kimiko and Frenchie uh, get caught up by uh, Zoe. And that's what I was thinking because like, other people had that theory too. Like the girl, you see that like that scene, you see part of it, at least in the teaser trailer because I've never seen the official trailer. That You see it in the teaser trailer. I was like, is that supposed to be Newman's daughter, Zoe? And um, so it turns out, yeah, that's that's her ability. She proceeds to kill everyone. And then she proceeded to rip off Kimiko's arm. And I'm like, we're not concerned about getting that back. Like, shouldn't she reattach it? And then she pulls a dead pull. I'm like, oh, cool. Baby arm. Okay. 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 I, I, I see. I see how this is. I was like, interesting. This is also like the first time we've seen how crazy her healing factor is. Like I said, it's fucking Deadpool levels of like healing factor. Holy shit. Wasn't expecting it. Because like the most she's ever gotten healed from is like deep wounds and being shot in the head and like slashed up by noir and neck broken stuff like that. But nothing so severe as literally losing a limb and then growing it back. But I love she jumps out the window and he tries to fly up to grab her and misses her because of the baby arms. And then she hits the ground and goes splat. Luckily caught Frenchie and uh, th that shit is gnarly where she just sits up and they don't even show you but you see part of her face is leaning to the right and everyone's like oh god and so she like slides her face back into place and heals it's like yeah just just as beautiful as ever Karen uh so that was that was a whole interesting sequence which that whole thing has led to other, literally everyone else. It's like, yeah, we need to kick Billy out. No one wants Billy on the team. The only person fighting for keep, because literally, he's literally on everyone's shit list after everything last season, but also just the culmination of everything. Shuey's the last person who continues to hold out hope for Butcher. Once again, it's deep, 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 deep. There's something deep, deep, deep inside. Like Frenchie said, balls deep. Uh, there, but there's something there where he he can be an asshole. He can be a right cunt, but you know he there there is some good in there, you know. And so like, but no one else wants him on the team anymore. It's like, yeah, he screwed the pooch on this mission, and he almost got you killed again. But like, it's like, no, we're not benching. We're not we're not leaving Butcher behind. Like we're, we're bringing him along because you know also Huey's so indebted to him. It's like, right, he saved me, and I I owe him, and I can't. He is essentially like family to Huey. Like, he was there for Huey when no one else was after Robin, you know? Even when, his sadly, his own dad was. I mean, his dad was there for him in his own way. But at the time, you think, like, oh, your dad's kind of a dick for telling you to... But it's like, yeah, you, you, we've, we've come to understand. And even Huey's come to understand his father in a different light than he did, like, in comparison to season one. Uh, but, yeah, but, like, Butcher is, like, the only other family he's got in this world in, in his mind, so... Which leads to Butcher deciding to make some uh, moves of his own as he decides to meet up with uh, Victoria and lets her know like, oh yeah, I know about everything that happened at Godolkin. I know about that virus you're planning to use against Homelander, which won't be strong enough to kill him yet. Which I'm like, interesting. I'm like, how do you know? Like, like how do you, you know all that stuff? Of like, how do you know for sure that that wouldn't be? I mean, you've I guess you've tested the metal of like, yeah, acid didn't work and a bullet to the head didn't work. So, um, well, I mean, at least for Victoria and Victoria is probably not as strong as Homelander. So that is interesting. And, and she thought that was her little secret. It's like, yeah, she doesn't know Billy was sniffing around uh, Godolkin um, during the events of Gen V. So... But in exchange for working together to take down, it's specifically to get Ryan away from Homelander. It's like, right, this kind of benefits all of us, especially because Homelander, it's like, as Billy puts it, Homelander basically hooked you up with your VP position. And basically, you're going to be bending over, taking it up the ass forever with Homelander if we don't nip this in the butt. So it's a win-win. I get Ryan away from Homelander. You put yourself in a more favorable position to deal with Homelander because he's not just our issue is everyone's issue, but in particular ours. And, um, so 
she wants the Red River files, and it seems like Billy might actually do it. I was so curious who the person was that Billy was talking to the entire time. I don't know why it didn't immediately cross my mind that, of course, it would be Becca, because she represents the good in him, represents that, just like the good in Ryan, she represents the good in Billy, too. You know, she always kind of satiated the beast in him, because a lot of who his father was, she was able to kind of, I think, help erode it. Doesn't change the fact is the abuse and everything that he had to deal with from his father, uh, the psychological and physical abuse ended up morphing him into, sadly, his own father. But I think Becca and Huey have kind of, like, closed that, like, at least eroded some of that erosion in, 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 in their own way. But even she calls Billy out, like, oh, you really going to screw over Huey again, you know? Because you know this is going to blow up in your face. Again, I asked you to protect Ryan. He's like, I did during the season three finale, you know, and I, I try to keep my promise. It's like, what more do you want me to do? And it's like, I want you to be the man that I married. But for him, it's like that man died all those years ago when he thought Becca died. Like, once again, that gave him the excuse to kind of become more like his father um, after he thought Becca was gone. So it's like that man was gone so long ago, but he's still there. You know, especially because he's also, once again, having his midlife crisis, crisis with the limited amount of time he's got left. So, of course, he, I think that's also another reason, like, because I have such limited time, I'm not going to be so focused on Homelander. Because he had that conversation with Joe, which, having Jeffrey D. Morgan, I was, like, so excited when I saw him in the teaser. I'm, I'm curious to see how much of the season he's going to be in. But... He knows the shit show that was last season. He's like, oh, you had a shot at Homelander, but you missed it. You know, in fact, you turned against Homelander's dad. And it's like, oh, did you take your eye off the ball? Because they had this whole parallel about how Grace has taken her eyes off the ball. She's so focused on killing Newman, but it's only like the reason why that pressure's coming down. It's like, well, it makes sense. The last thing you want is Newman in that position, but it's like, who's the greater evil, Homelander or Newman? You know, it's like we're not even like dedicating time to Homeland or to be fair, he's on trial. We probably don't want to do anything while he's kind of even more in the spotlight now. But it's also the element of Robert Singer, which I was like shocked of like, oh, well, it makes sense that they would get to him to be like, yo, your VP is the head popper. You need to be careful of her. So he's weary about it because he's like, yo, if I'm not careful, my head's going to pop. So I can only avoid her for so long. But he's the one that kind of is like, I think he's the one that suggested the asset to get used against her, or try to present, maybe that was what was in the vial that, uh, or the bottle that Frenchie and Kimiko, like I said, maybe that was kind of meant to be like an eye thing of like, yeah, acid to our eyes and burn them out so she couldn't use her powers. And once again, just spitballing theories on how that might have been utilized and used, so. And now all this pressure is kind of coming down on M.M., who has been the one forced to take charge which i love how that all kind of worked out where it's like right butcher's been in charge for so long last season huey was basically in charge for at least a tiny bit and then all of it went back to butcher's power and now it's like yeah mm's leading which makes a lot of sense he is the heart of the team makes a lot of sense for him to be the head honcho especially because billy's on everyone's shit list so fuck no is billy gonna lead this squad again so I was so curious about where Billy and um, Mallory stood because of the Gen V thing, because we, you know, eventually found out that the person she was talking to was Billy. So now, well, we assume it was Billy. She could have easily been talking to MM and MM like put Billy on it. It could have been that. Like, she ain't fucking with Billy. Because she's like, yo, you're not even coming into this meeting. He's like, oh, come on. I'm going to get Ryan back, I swear. And she, she's done with him. I mean, I'm sure, like, episode three, the whole truth about um, Soldier Boy and everything, I'm sure that, in conjunction with Ryan, it's kind of, like, made her extra pissed at Billy. So, I think the Ryan thing takes precedent because it's like, well, he was literally one of our few weapons against Homelander you know, and you kind of screw the pooch on that, and now the world might have to deal with double the Homelander. Doesn't seem like he has his father's affinity for milk, though, because he's like, oh, come on, celebrate with a cold glass of milk, and it's like, well, I'm, well, I know Homelander drinks it cold, warm, straight out of the teat, doesn't matter. Um, but yeah, it doesn't seem like Ryan has that same proclivity. It's like, well, we know that's a deep psychological 
thing manifesting like that because of, hey, I was born in a lab. I had no mother or father really, you know, in my life. So, or really no mother at all, but that's why he gravitates to it. So it's like Ryan didn't have that issue. He had his mom his entire life. So, well, sadly until the season two finale, but you, you get the point I'm making. So, of course, he wouldn't have that same weird proclivity. Some other th uh, things. Uh, we had the whole situation with uh, the, the Seven. Obviously, uh, where the Seven left off last season with the three people that Homelander kind of has no choice but to keep around, but he doesn't trust. That being Ashley, A-Train, and The Deep. And Ashley's just doing her job as a yes person, saying like, oh, thank you for saving my life at Godolkin. Um, the fact of the matter is we should rebuild the seven. Here's some people on the list. Uh, one of the people we saw on the list is Tech Knight. I'm assuming every name on that list is someone straight up, like they're characters from the comics that you may or may not ever get to see. So obviously we got Tech Knight last, uh, in, in season one of the uh, uh, Gen V, so... What was that one person there like, oh yeah, was it like the Wrangler? And it's like, oh yeah, he's that guy from Texas that the uh, the Texas office like kind of had to, or like the Austin office had to kind of like distance himself because he killed all those migrant workers. You're like, yikes. Uh, big, big old yikes. Um, but Homelander's so tired of all the yes men around him. And he's like, all right, Deep, you want to just be a yes man? Go over there, pull out A-Train's cock and suck it. I was like, oh, fuck. And a part of me was like, isn't that something... F I, have, I should also note, if, if, if this is the first time you're coming across my reviews or discussions, I've never read the comic book. I swear, what didn't Homelander... Someone, someone had to correct me. I don't remember if this is like a hero gasm thing from the comics. I don't remember if, if it was a Soldier Boy thing. Because doesn't, like, Homelander have sex with Soldier Boy? Because there's, like, different... The version of Soldier Boy we got in the TV show is very different from the one that's, like, typically in the comics. I think there's two different Soldier Boys in the comics. Um, or, was it, or was it the deep? Like, I swear, like, something like that happened. I don't remember if it's, like, in correlation to the Annie situation because that plays out similarly but differently in the comic books because there's actually more to it. It's more effed up in the comics. The whole deep in anything, like, it, there's more people involved. It's the effed up thing in the comics. That's my understanding. I don't remember if it's in correlation with that. Or, like, I swear, like, there was, like, some point, like, Homelander forced one of the males on the Seven, like, to blow him or something. Or, make, like, he, like, just to assert dominance. I swear, I feel like I remember that, like, stumbling across that and something. But, I, like I said, I don't remember what that was in correlation with. But that was, like, I don't know if that was something in correlation with Soldier Boy, Hero Gasm, or all of that because like the deep is kind of like the whipping boy like not just in the show i think even in the comics amongst the seven he was always like the you know the lowest end of the the totem and he was about to do it i was like oh my god this is about to happen and the deep's like you know what was he he was saying like he was like basically like sex is a spectrum right bro but then uh homelander was like oh get up it's like he's like yeah i want you to have some backbone it's like you're such an oxymoron uh, Homelander, because you want people to stand up to you, but you also strike fear and want people to always be your yes men. But it's like, yeah, at this point in time, like, all that gratification doesn't mean anything to him anymore. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second when we talk about him and Sage, but what I thought was also so interesting about that scene, if you, like, they linger on it. Ashley, she smiles at that. She kind of, like, she was kind of vibing for that, and it's like, well, we know Ashley's proclivities because of her whole situation with Cameron and uh, a certain strap one, you know. So it's like, yeah, we know where Ashley's. But I'm like, I think it's also because, like, she hates the deep and A-Train. So it's almost kind of like a, yeah, like, there, there's a little power tripping there. But I, I don't know if it's just like she did. It's, it could be a combination of because it's A-Train and the deep. And it's like she likes them being humiliated because it makes her feel good. But also, like, she just set she, on a personal like sexual level she enjoys it. it could be a combination of the two but anyway speaking of sage uh the uh homelander went to go visit her and even she pointed out something even i immediately noticed i was like yo he's not in his costume it is the only time in a show this is the only time in a show we've ever seen him in regular clothes because like 
Because I was about to say, even A-Train you've seen him in regular clothes. I think the only other person we've never seen in regular clothes is The Deep and Noir. I think they're the only ones we've never seen in regular garb. But like every other member of the Seven, we saw in regular clothes. Well, except for Translucent because like he was always just naked. So, there's that. I'll circle back to the noir thing because I want to talk about that for a little bit. But going with the whole Sage situation, she's the one kind of inspiring Homelander because he comes to her for advice because like, hey, you're super smart and I want to know how I should handle this situation because she basically was able to read him like a book of like, oh, I know there's this, this, and this. Um, kind of knowing the shit show situation that Homelander finds himself in and ultimately suggest a plan of well, how you should approach this is like Greece. She's like, instead of like you tearing down the monument, it's like that's just going to have people build it back up and they'll be against you. What you do is you have the people go at each other's throat. When they tear it down, you swoop in like the savior and you're, you're you know, and as we see as the episode plays out, is exactly like she planned it out to be. Um, plan ended up being way more vicious than I thought it was going to be. I, I don't know what I thought the plan was going to be, how that was going to be represented, but wasn't expecting the situation to play out. Because at first I'm like, what is up with killing these people with these bats? Like, what is it? I'm like, okay, okay, I, I, I see the play here. But um, he likes her plan. And she even says, like, right, I can't be a part of the seven uh, because you'll never let, for one, not only a woman, but also a black woman be smarter than you. And he's like, yeah, he's like, I'm pretty smart. She's like, see, but he's like, but I'm also smart enough to listen and I'm willing to listen. So are you ready to kind of enact this plan? And she's part of the seven. She was also not a fan of like joining up like with the suit and everything. She's like, no, nah, I'm not, not going to do that. Because I think the bits I saw of her in the teaser trailer were from this scene, but I think they were from later scenes too, where she just is, I think she's in regular clothes. I don't think she's wearing a, um costume so we'll circle back to all that like because there's just so much to discuss or like do a lot at you in this episode since i brought him up i want to talk about noir um i won't spoil anything once again just one of those comic things you just stumble across that information and you read it and you're like oh that's interesting but you're like all right the show is so far away from the comic that you're like okay that's not going to be that feels like it still won't be that either because uh, that was a theory I had of like, okay, so are they leaning more into what the comic book is? Because Black Noir circumstances are vastly different in the comic book than what it is in a TV show. I won't spoil what they are just in case they decide to go down that route. Based on what we heard from Black Noir this episode, does it sound like that might be the route they're going down? But we don't know at this point. They, that could still be a twist or a future development for this character, you know? Maybe there isn't just going to be a second Black Noir. Maybe we'll get a Black Noir 3 that might be closer to the comic book version. You know, stuff like that. So, remember, like I said, maybe that's just... We'll have to wait to see how that develops because it might just be, hey, they're not doing that at all. Even at this point, even though they have the opportunity to, they might still choose not to adapt Black Noir circumstances from the comics. So. Um, but yeah, either way. We also had the introduction to, uh, was there Firecracker, Truth Bomb with Firecracker, which I kept looking. I didn't notice this because I, like I said, I only saw the teaser and she's only like in a couple shots and I never freeze frame. But it wasn't until I was watching, I was like, isn't that who I think it is? I looked it up. Yeah, it's, the actress's name is Valerie Curry. The things I best know her from is The Following. It was a TV show on Fox. It's kind of a crime drama with Kevin Bacon. Um... I'm trying to also think, like, had I ever, have I ever seen her with long hair? Because I think her hair kind of grows out a little bit in the following, but it's been so long, so I don't remember. But the other thing I best remember her from, if you've ever played the video game Detroit uh, Become Human, she's Kara. So I was like, oh, man. I was like, I kept looking at her face. But like I said, I don't think I've ever seen her with long hair. I've always seen her with short hair, that I think, at least to my recollection. So... Yeah, I, I forgot to talk about this angle, how they spin the narrative about the guy that Homelander killed. It's like, well, it's like, oh, the guy threw a projectile. It's like, he threw a bottle at your son. And it's like, it's oh, there could have been anthrax in it. I mean, even if it couldn't hurt us, still the principle of the matter. It's like, it's still understandable. Uh, but uh, the, the narrative is to spin it like he's a PDF file. Uh, you know, phrasing it that way because, once again... Everyone's a little like, I don't know how that YouTube algorithm is going to hit, you know. So uh, certain words get flagged. So I'm like, ah, for my sanity's sake, I'll just say it like that. Because that's usually everyone's way around saying that word that we all know. 
And so, they, they threw in a lot of uh, certain lingo, too, in this episode. It's like, oh, like, uh, Homelander referring to uh, Victoria as a libtard. I'm like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because um, also, I mean, no politician is universally loved. There's no politician. Um, but we got an insight into Gen V, like, how split that is. But, I mean, once again considering how everything is in this episode and the show in general, it's also supposed to be reflective of the world, how super divisive the world is. Like, down that middle, you know, that blue and red line and other people just fall somewhere outside of that spectrum or somewhere in the middle of all of that. Um, you know, people, people dug in on their sides. Like, obviously, it's heavily uh, brought out about because of those who stand with Homelander and those who stand with Annie, which that's a whole complicated thing in itself because for Annie... Like she is, she is the face of the operation, but she she doesn't want it. She kind of wants the Spider Man approach of it's supposed to be bigger than me. For one, I don't want to use the Starlight brand. That's too associated with Vaught. It's too. I, I I don't want that. I want it to be kind of like this is about everyone. This could be anyone type of thing. That's why she doesn't want to make appearances. She also doesn't want to appear as Starlight because it's like no, I'm not Starlight. I'm Annie now. I'm Annie January. That's all there is to it. I want to be me. Starlight is a product that they made. Annie is who I am, and I'm I'm this fight's so important that I'm I want to be me in this situation. I don't just want to be. The person that they and, and product they they want me to be type of situation. So, uh, one of the people amongst our camp, his name is Colin, which we'll get to him in a second. Funny enough, uh, he's played by an actor named Elliot Knight. He was in a show back in 2016 called American Gothic with Anthony Starr, which I was like, oh, that's funny how that works out. Um, either way. Colin's really interesting because it turns out there's something going on between him and uh, Frenchie. Like, they go to, like, a, a um, AA meeting, and there's kind of something there, which I was like, okay, because I went, after last season, I'm like, I'm not fully sure where him and Kimiko stand, because she made the whole point of, like, right, we're more like family and everything, which it seems like she co-signs that later on, because she's like, yo, I love you, but I'm like, I've heard this phrase before, funny enough. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. So she's like, yo, if there's something between you and Colin, like, kind of go for it. So it's like, okay, yeah. Once, so it's kind of sad that's not a thing. But she's also like, right, I'm, I'm happy for you, and I wish you the best. Now, I'm wondering if they're giving Frenchie kind of that Winter Soldier storyline. If you've seen Falcon and a Winter Soldier, the moment, like, the fact is when he was with Colin, and he woke up in the middle of the night and saw that picture of Colin's family, he put it down. I was like... Because he said, like, Colin and me, our circumstances are complicated. And who did they show in the opening that they were recapping stuff? Which, obviously, like, they were recapping Nina. So, obviously, she's still out and about. So, she's probably going to make an appearance. Or, this might tie into Frenchie's backstory of, like, what he did stuff. He did hits for Nina. So, it's probably, like I said, the Winter Soldier thing of, oh, let me get, I'm close to this person who I kind of screwed them over. Once again, Falcon and Winter Soldier dived into one of those situations where Bucky is close to someone he, a family member of someone he killed. So that seems like that might complicate things between Frenchie and Colin if the truth ever comes out. So that, that to me gave me all the insight of like, yeah, we're going to find out Frenchie killed like either like one, if not all of his family members. I mean, that would probably lead to him kind of getting mixed up with drugs and stuff like that. So so that's kind of a double thing of not only did I hurt you by killing potential A family member or multiple family members, I'm also the reason why you started using drugs in the first place and had to get clean. Like, you know, I'm partially responsible for that. So, well, not partially, probably entirely responsible for that, but you get the point I'm trying to make. You have Huey dealing with the fact is, hey, he ignored his father's phone call and then later on gets a call from the hospital. His dad had a stroke. You're like, Jesus Christ. And especially for Huey because, once again, this, him and his dad have definitely had a better relationship as the show has gone on. Uh, we only got, like, a small appearance from Simon Pegg last uh, season over, like, um, FaceTime, uh, like, in episode one. But, yeah, it's just finding out, like, his dad's in this situation. And even if his dad does recover, like, 
the the type of life he'd be leading leading after like afterwards especially when you tie that into butcher circumstances it's like right like if i was in that situation basically pull the plug on me i'd rather not have to live my life wouldn't want to live his life with that type of situation especially obviously with his time clicking down uh, which is interesting too because if you notice like Huey does catch like when he's pouring the drink his hand, uh, hand is shaking but Huey doesn't really press too much he probably has somewhat of an idea but it's like well his dad's in his condition right now so it's like that's a more pressing matter so I also love that whole bit about his dad being a massive James Patterson fan in fact he was calling him to talk about books James Patterson books it was it Deadly Cross and he started listing off of because I've read maybe like two James Patterson books one was an Alex Cross book. I don't remember. I want to say it was Double Cross. I wanted because it wasn't even mine. It was one of my. It was my mom's book. It's one of the few books I've read in my spare time outside of like uh, mandatory to read something for school. And I should also tell you, anytime there was something mandatory to read for school, I never fucking read it anyway because I don't really hate reading books. Uh, just that's just me. But. I want to say it was Double Cross I read. It's been so long. Don't ask me about the plot. I remember. I, I, I'm not even going to say I remember a little bit. I don't think I remember anything. It's been that long. I probably haven't read it since like high school. So either way. Uh, but yeah, it started, started listing off like all these different James Patterson books. And just that line from Huey being like, right, you wake up. I will talk to you about. We can talk about any of the James Patterson books. We can talk about Deadly Cross for hours on end. Just wake up. And then lo and behold, his mom shows up. Which I was like, that thread has been sitting around since season two. The reveal that like, oh, his mom isn't dead. That his mom's alive. She just left. And so they 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 tease you because I, I, I've not looked at the cast. So I don't know who is playing his mom. I'm like, oh, it's got to be someone. Who, oh, who's going to be playing Huey's mom? So, but I figure that thread has been sitting out there the entire time. I was like, well, you've got to pull on that at some point in time. And lo and behold, we're picking this season to do it. So it's kind of interesting that it took all of this to kind of drag her back into their lives, you know, because it's like, well, Huey's the emergency contact, so I wonder, maybe her name is still on some emergency contacts or something like that, like, how did she find out about it? Like, you know, or like, it's like, I wonder if we're going to find out they're actually still technically married or something like that, or are they just kind of technically, like, maybe in the eyes of the law, they never got divorced, they're still separate, because I'm like, why would you, how would you know to come here? Like, because Huey wouldn't have been able to get in contact with you to find out. Maybe it has something to do with who his mom is. Maybe she's a government person herself like how she was able to know all this who knows another thing i almost let slip my mind is i want to talk about the deep situation because he was obviously having to talk about cassandra's book in too deep we got teased uh, with that scene and everything at the end of season two uh, at the end of season three and he's like pushing back on it, being like, oh yeah, like the octopus. He's like, I, that's, that's slander by a jilted ex. I've never slept with an octopus in my life, which we all know is completely not a BS. Uh, but it's like, yeah, like, yeah, I've already let her go, which I'm like, the moment he said that, I was like, you definitely didn't. And it's like, yeah, like she was a jilted lover and she also pooped on my back. I was like, oh, okay, and there's the Johnny and Amber angle to it. I was like, okay. Because they, uh, they pop culture and everything because they uh they made reference to that in uh specifically the tech night episode which was episode four of gen v so tying that in in that capacity so that was interesting but it also turned out yes he kept ambrosius and i was like the moment i heard that voice i was like whose voice is that i was like it's got to be someone very specific it is it's fucking tilda swinton of course i was like wow because i knew it had to be, especially because the reason why i say that too is like let's not forget was it season one his gills was it season one or season two no it's season two his gills are voiced by pat and oswald's pat and oswald so you know so i figured it had to be like a, a pretty well-known person that was going to end up voicing ambrosius who was like yeah let's go off go somewhere where we can be together you know and not not have to be sh ashamed of our love and everything so i'm like okay deep uh your animal circumstances have never worked out in your favor ergo like the uh dolphin in season one or the crab you tried it was it the crab you tried to save also in season one let's not forget about the whale in season two let's not forget about timothy last season you know it's just like your circumstances were ambrosius has lasted longer than any other animal you've interacted with any sea creature you've interacted with over the course of the show which means she's going to get severely like screwed over in the probably worst way possible so yeah there's also the uh, storyline element with 
M.M. and uh, his ex. It turns out Janine's kind of been in her rebellious streak uh, because apparently she knocked out a boy at school and she's been kind of like telling someone to eat a dick. She's slamming doors. It's like, oh, she's going through her teenage rebellious phase. But even M.M. kind of brought that up last season of uh, Frenchie. Like, yeah, but my daughter, like her only image is going to be her father knocking out her stepfather. Turns out, obviously, Todd and... Um, Monique went their separate ways, understandably. Uh, apparently, she kicked him out, and she's worried about him because Janine is also acting this way because regardless of it all, Todd was really good with her, and that's the one thing M.M. will give him because he's like, yo, can't be sex. That can't be the reason why you were with him, right, Monique? And she was kind of like, hey, yo. And Frenchie doubled down on that. It's like, oh, that guy's got to be hung for the fact is that, like, for Monique, like a babe like Monique to stick with him, you know he's got to have something swinging between his legs or something like that. Which, you know, M.M. is not trying to have that conversation. So, the way Monique was acting, it must have a cannon or something. So, but yeah, they end up tracking down Todd. You knew it was like some, some shit was about to go down because the person he was meeting up with was another dude. Who, and they were all meeting up. Well, I think it was two other dudes. And they were meeting up with Sage. So, to go there, Homelander's there. They're fanboying out. You're like, what's going on here? And basically, they get sacrificed. He hands a bat to, a bat gets hit like... Deep, A-Train, and Noir all get bats. It's like, yeah, beat these people to death. And I was like, would Marvin and them be able to get to Todd in time? Sadly, no. Uh, which, obviously, very poetic having James... Uh, I was about to call him James. Jesus. I hope I didn't call him James earlier. I'm Jeffrey Dean Morgan. If I called him James earlier when I was referencing him, I, I do apologize. But very poetic to have him here uh, as they, everyone in this situation proceeded to get fucking negan You know? Uh, if you've never seen The Walking Dead, well, that's what happened in this episode. That's pretty much what it means to get Negan. So, yeah. And I thought it was interesting, too, in that moment, you know, uh, Deep and New Noir are A-OK -okay doing this. A-Train didn't. Like, he, he got in front of um, Todd, but he didn't actually kill him. It was like, I think it was uh, the Deep who did it. But... You're like, damn, you suck, Todd, but, man, you didn't deserve that, to be a sacrificial lamb for this cause. This thing that you are all about, this hero that you believe in. Once again, never meet your heroes, right? So, I mean, he, didn't, he was amongst so crowd there at the season three finale, so it, who knows what interaction they had, but this was a much more deeper interaction, and it ended up ending up like this. They started a, a fight between... Homelander's people and Starlight's people, once the verdict came out, Sage instigated all of it. People got into a tussle, and when it was all said and done, A-Train basically sped those three bodies, including Todd, to the scene to make it seem like, oh my god, these were people that were on um, Homelander's side. Look what Starlight's people did, just creating those narratives. Especially when Starlight showed up to try and mitigate that whole situation but you know like homelander gets to be there and gets to soak up all not only is he not guilty he gets to come off looking like yeah my my peaceful protesters people who stuck by me who didn't believe in this corrupt judiciary system had my back but see what happened so yeah he's riding the high to all this but once again the ryan warning billy to stay around kind of caused issues there which i'm sure he's going to use sage as a means to try and get ryan more on his side and i think that's going to blow up in his face all the stuff about billy doing the wrong thing blowing up in his face i think it's going to happen to homelander this season potentially i think that'd be the interesting thing of like the inverse to be fair there's plenty of time for butcher to like fuck this up and do the wrong thing again but you know you know life gives you different perspective when you know your time is up knowing you could die at any point in time is one thing, but knowing like, no, there's a literal clock ticking and I know I'm going to die soon. You know, it, it adds perspective on things. Cause Sage had that whole conversation with Homelander about nothing makes you happy. Having all these people around you cheering you and applauding you. The thing you thought you always wanted, it doesn't make you happy. And even she's like, doing all this might not even make you happy. It's like, yeah, but it might get him in the direction of happiness is what he's aiming for and hoping for. But we'll see. You know, he's never going to ever be satisfied or properly fulfilled because he's empty on the inside. Just like Edgar said, you're just bad product. Um... You know, but anyway, I went on a massive, massive, 
I'm probably still missing stuff that I didn't cover, but I wanted to try and cover every angle of this because there's just so much that went down in this one episode alone. Still got two more to go, so it's definitely going to be interesting to see where the other episodes, but the next episode in particular, takes us going forward with all of this. But really, that's all I wanted to talk about. Till the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and goodbye.